Good morning, good morning, good morning. You're here at the Humanists of Greater Portland. I want to welcome everyone here at our Friendly House audience and then also the Zoom audience. Humanism is a philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. Humanists, like those gathered here today, attempt to live the best life they can envision because this is the only life of which we are certain. Humanists affirm the dignity of all people. Humanists value people not only for all that they have accomplished in the arts, science, and humanities, but also simply for their human potential. The Humanists of Greater Portland uh, we're members, uh, we're chapter members of the American Humanist Association. And the American Humanist Association recognizes that humans are reasonable beings and that reasoning and the scientific method are the means to finding truth. Our topic this morning, emerging technologies based on quantum mechanical principles and their potential impacts uh, that uh, is the program based on science, is a program based on science and an example of human achievement through science. Anne Henderson, one of our very popular readers, will be our reader this morning. Come on in, Anne. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read um, President Biden uh, two years ago uh, did a proclamation on uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, it, it we haven't gotten, it's not a federal holiday yet. We I think there's like 20 states that have it. But anyway, he, he was the first of, uh, of the federal government to uh, do this proclamation. I've, I've cut out a couple of things that were very um, political. So um, since time immemorial, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and Native Hawaiians have built vibrant and diverse cultures, safeguarding land, nature, I'm sorry, land, language, spirit, knowledge, and tradition across the generations. On Indigenous Peoples Day, our nation celebrates the invaluable contributions and resilience of, indig of Indigenous people. They had to be resilient. Uh, regard recognizes their inherent sovereignty and commits to honoring the federal government's trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations. Our country was conceived on a promise of equality and opportunity for all people, a promise that despite the extraordinary progress we have made through the years, we have never fully lived up to. That is especially true when it comes to upholding the rights and dignities of the indigenous people who were here long before colonization of the Americas began. For generations, po uh, federal policies systematically sought to assimilate and displace Native American people and erase and eradicate Native cultures. Today, we recognize Indigenous people's resilience and strength, as well as the immeasurable positive impact that they have made on every aspect of American society. We also recommit to supporting a new, brighter future of promise and, e and equity for tribal nations, a future grounded in tribal sovereignty and respect for the human rights of indigenous people in the Americas and around the world. The federal government has a solemn obligation to lift up and invest in the future of indigenous peoples and empower tribal nations to govern their own communities and make their own decisions. We must never forget the centuries long campaign of violence, displacement, assimilation, and terror wrought upon native communities and tribal nations throughout our country. Today, we acknowledge the significant sacrifices made by native peoples to this country and recognize their many ongoing contributions to our nation. On Indigenous Peoples Day, we honor America's first inhabitants and the tribal nations that continue to thrive today. I encourage everyone to celebrate and recognize the many indigenous communities and cultures that make up our great country. And that was that was really lovely. And I, I want to sincerely thank you, Anne, for all the wonderful readings you find and search for us. It's it's really well done. Thank you. All right. But well, I want to introduce our speaker. We're in for a real treat today. 
uh, Dr. Stephen Leiler received uh, his PhD in mathematics from the University of Oregon in 1981. He is the recipient of several teaching awards from organizations such as Portland State University and the Mathematical Association of America. He has authored or co-authored dozens of peer-reviewed and frequently cited publications in various areas of mathematics, physics, engineering, and art. Uh, for example, his early work, I find this one fascinating, uh, in the theory of knots included the simultaneous discovery of a uh, now called the Blyler and Nagasaki knot. Nakanishi. Nakanishi. I practiced this. And I knew I was going to get it wrong. <laughs> I'm famous for that, Steve. I'm famous for mispronouncing. Yeah, Hero would kill me if I didn't I know. You got to say it right. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's see. Knot. Uh, a knot that, upon being made cleverly more complicated, becomes easier to untie. Currently, he is in his 36th year of service at Portland State University, where he holds the position of professor of mathematics and statistics. Steve, thanks so much for doing this for Thank us you. today. And I would like to say, uh, Helen and the executive committee of the humanists uh, for this opportunity uh, to do a little song and dance about uh, the coming technology that maybe you should be worried about. <laughs> uh, don't be worried about AI folks that's trained on human frailty. So uh, there's no danger from artificial intelligence. So today I'm going to talk to you about technologies based on quantum mechanical principles. So quantum technology. So it's in the news a, a lot. And basically, this is the result of Moore's law, which says that every 18 months or so, the size of computer hardware gets cut in half. And the amount of computing power for the same amount of electrical input doubles. Okay, so this has been Moore's law. Uh, Mr. Moore was president of Intel back in the 80s. And he, uh, I don't know, that's not from my machine. There we go. Something else is happening there. Uh, anyway, uh, what's happened now, though, is that, you know, chips have gotten ever more complicated. And the transistors in those chips are down to about two atoms each, three atoms each. They're just so small that what's happened is, is that it's being left the macrocosmic world that we live in, which we believe is governed by classical Newtonian mechanics. And instead, these devices and their bits now are so small, they live in the quantum mechanical world, where they're governed by a completely different set of physical laws. Okay. And there we are. Now, again, where does this quantum come from and why does it change? Well, it's because it's easy to think, as Newton thought and as physicists thought until the late 19th century, that energy flowed continuously in an unbroken stream, like a river or water poured from a jar. As it turns out, uh, at the very smallest scales, that simply is not true. Okay? Energy flows in chunks. Uh, an individual chunk is called a quantum. The plural is quanta, being uh, Latin. And you should think about it. Why do we think it looks like a fluid? Well, it's because think of your days in the sandbox. Everything we've learned that's important, we learned in kindergarten, right? <laughs> you can pour sand out of, a, out of a bucket just the same way you can pour water. And in fact, in many ways, that flow of sand resembles that flow of water. You know, you can fill a container, it goes into all the little corners. Uh, and so the illusion of fluidity, the illusion of continuity is just because the quanta themselves are so small and there are so many of them that it gives us the illusion uh, of fluid, okay? So again, it's a lot different being hit by a drop of water than being hit by a chunk of sand, especially if that chunk of sand is, say, 10,000 times bigger than you are. So it's a boom. So it is a lot different. And so uh, this is just looks really different. So what we see is the summation of zillions upon zillions, those are technical terms, by the way, uh, uh, of quantum operations. And they all add up to the what we see. And remember, when you go to a movie, you think that motion is continuous. You're totally fooled, right? 
but you know that's 24 frames per second. It's chunk, 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 chunk. And your thought process just fills in the gap and makes it look continuous to you. It's kind of the same idea, okay? And so I have to say that some of these, I don't know if, we can, if you can read that on your screen, but some of these processes are so counter intuitional to those of us who have been conditioned on large scale physics. You do a million Newtonian experiments, it's really hard to do a quantum experiment with an open mind because you've sort of, your lizard brain's been trained to sort of think in the following way. You become sort of jaded. And in fact, that conditioning was so strong that even some of the greatest minds of the earliest 20th century could not let that go and just could never accept some of the things that happen in quantum mechanics, despite the evidence getting ever and ever more overwhelming. Uh, Einstein is the famous example of never accepting uh, the notion of entanglement. Uh, Heisenberg not accepting the fact that things are random. God does not play dice. As a matter of fact, God does, and he loads them. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the crazy thing about it. On the other hand, there are four fingers and a thumb, but uh, it is not, if you approach it with an open mind and you try to free yourself from the jadedness of this sort of Newtonian and Euclidean experience that we have on the large scale, it turns out that you can grab these novel principles and you can put them to work for you. And uh, there are all kinds of problems that classical computers will never solve. We have quantum computers in just a heartbeat. And so searching is one of them. Optimization, another, what's the best choice? Constraint satisfaction, is there something that meets all these conditions? Uh, that type of stuff just flows right into quantum parallelism uh, really quickly. And hopefully I'll get to uh, one of those topics uh, or not. Okay, so um, I should say that there, you know, 20 years ago when I first gave talks like this, there was only quantum information and computation. Now, as everything, we become ever more specialized, right? Now there is now whole subfields of quantum algorithms, which are recipes for quantum computers. Okay, there are uh, quantum games, playing games over a quantum internet, uh, for example. Uh, there's this whole notion of quantum stochastics, which is this whole new probability theory, much more rich. And uh, hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have a feel for the difference between it and classical statistics and why we, that is what you should be worried about far more than artificial intelligence. There you go. Anyway. I, you should not be amazed that this sounds like science fiction to you. Uh, it sounds like science fiction to me. So I thought the best place was to start there. So we'll talk about flipping coins with Picard and Q on the Enterprise D. Okay. And uh, so just to give you an idea of the time frame, there's Tasha Yar in the back. Uh, looking on, the Enterprise is facing an accidental crisis. Things are looking pretty sad. And who should appear on the bridge but our old friend Q? Uh, who offers to Captain Picard, I will uh, save the Enterprise uh, and, and ease your worries. Uh, but first, you have to prove yourself worthy. And to prove yourself worthy, you have to beat me at a little coin flip game. We're just going to be flipping, you know, a little coin flip game. And if you can prove yourself worthy, I'll save the Enterprise and I'll go on your merry way. Otherwise, you can just get out of this yourself. So let's take a look at this coin flip game. Uh, that will work. So we'll have Picardans who will be our two players. And we're gonna act on the orientation of a coin. So this coin has two orientations, heads and tails, yes. And as far as Picard knows, it's a real life coin. He's looking in this little box that looks like a little coin. Uh, so he believes it to be classical. Here's how the plane is, is going. Uh, the coin's in the box and we look inside the box and the coin is in the state head. So there's the head smiling up. I mean, the great bird of the galaxy is on the tail, and I don't know, I don't know who's on the head. William Shatner's head is probably on the top. Uh, the box is then closed. Q does something to the coin. Picard does something to the coin. Q does something to the coin. And we open the box. And we look at the coin. And if the box, if we look at the coin, and if the box is still in the state heads, heads, that's a win for Q. And if we see a tails, that's a win for Picard. So I'm gonna do a call and response now so that the studio audience can feel engaged. 
Uh, and since I'm a child of the uh, Cartoon Network generation, uh, it's going to be the Ren and Stimpy call and response. If you understand something when I say happy, happy, your response is joy, joy. See, there's my millennial daughter here who knows the response. So let's all try this together. Everybody understand this? Happy, happy. Boy, I get more enthusiasm out of 18 year olds. Come on now, you guys. Happy, happy. Yeah, okay, good. Now they can hear you on Zoom. Okay, good. All right. So anyway, if a card wins, Q will save the enterprise. If Q wins, uh, Picard will have to deal with that uh, on his own. Now, to make it more tempting to Picard, Q offers to play the game 10 times. And all Picard has to do is win once. Well, because, Mon Capitan, you are an inferior being. You know, so you just have to, you just have to win once. And furthermore, if you think I'm doing anything funny, after I do my first move, if you like, we'll open the box. You can look at the, see what's inside, and we'll just start over. We'll run that one again. Okay. So just because I know that you're an untrusting person. So, okay. Well, Picard, of course, has to take game theory at Starfleet Academy, right? You know, he's going to be a starship captain. He has to understand the game's works. So as far as Picard thinks, it's pretty fair because there's only two actions on this coin. I can leave it alone, no flip, or I can turn it over, flip. Heads becomes tails, tails becomes heads, right? Picard has one place to act. So that's a no flip or a flip. That's what you see there on the uh, leftmost column. The row across the top are the choices that Q has to act. He acts twice, so no flip, no flip, or no flip, flip, or flip, no flip, or flip, flip. Those are the four things that Q can do, okay? And you make this little table, and it tells you when you look at the coin what it's going to be. And for example, if, if nobody flips anything, that's that uh, upper leftmost corner, Q wins, because it's heads and it's stayed in heads the whole time. You move over one slot, uh, two no flips and a flip. Now it's tails that shows and Picard wins. Okay, that's how that little table is, is, is whipped off. And so Picard can do that. So Picard knows also uh, from game theory that when you're faced with a superior opponent, this is something we'll revisit later. The thing to do is to stop making decisions and randomize your decisions. Flip a coin where your opponent can't see it and let it choose. Your opponent can read you, but your opponent can't read a secret random event. Okay? And of course, if he does that, that says that Picard will win half the time. No matter what Q does. Picard knows the same thing applies to Q. And if Q applies each of his four choices one quarter of the time, Q can guarantee that he'll win just half the time. Happy, happy? Joy, joy. Okay. So over 10 tries, right? <clears throat> what does it take to lose 10 times in a row over 10 times? Well, 50% chance of winning times 10 times. Well, he's a 10,023 to one favorite. Okay. Two to the 10th is 1,024. So being a 1,001 favorite, Picard agrees. And then says, oh, this is great. We're going to be out of here. Well, what happens next? Well, you know what happens next, folks. Picard loses every single time. <laughs> you know, that, that is exactly what happens. And of course, over the course of play, and as the losses mount out, Picard makes several choices to observe the coin after Q's first move. You know, after he's lost five times in a row, six times in a row, we're going to start checking up on you, buddy. Right? And sure enough, about half the time, Picard sees heads, and the other half the time, Picard sees tails. Exactly as if Q was playing his optimal classical mixed strategy. Okay? Exactly what you see. So as far as Picard can tell, nothing untoward is going on. Okay? All right? Of course, now the Enterprise is lost. Right? But at least the crew escapes. I mean, after all, this is the humanists, right? We're not going to run them all into a black hole or something. And in the escape pod, pod Picard has time to think about this. He was over a thousand to one favorite, right? So guess what? He must have been cheated. But how? That's the question now that is haunting Picard. Okay, so everybody take a deep cleansing breath. Because <sighs> it's kind of a postcard from Mars. It's a quantum thing. Okay? And what we're talking about here now is a single bit of information. Okay? So one bit of information. 
And Picard is being cheated because that bit of information is not a classical bit, the sort of thing that Moore talks about, where it's an arrow pointing up at one or down at zero, right? Instead, it's a quantum bit with respect to this physical property of orientation, okay? It's a quantum object, okay? And the box that it's in is not an ordinary box, it's actually a measuring device. It actually looks at the quantum bit and measures it for the property of orientation, okay? So it's actually a measuring device, okay? Well, what does that mean to Q? What that means to Q is, is that there aren't just two orient states, heads and tails, okay, that the arrow could be pointing to. There's a whole soap bubble, a whole soap bubble of states that that arrow could be pointing to. The two that Picard knows about, heads and tails, are the North Pole and the South Pole of this soap bubble, okay? But there are all these gazillions of other points on the soap bubble that this quantum bit could be in, okay? So there's A, a lot more points uh, involved. Well, well, what that means is that there are lots more operations available to Q. All Picard can do is leave the North and South Pole alone or interchange them. Q can do anything he wants to that quantum bit. In particular, he could rotate it not 180 degrees, he could rotate it 90. And he could take the two poles to the equator. Happy, happy? See, uh, you know, Picard has no clue this is possible. Okay. But, you know, Q knows all of this. All right. So now uh, here's the postcard from Mars. Okay. To understand exactly how beautiful this scam is, and this is really a great scam. Because the victim not only is being cheated, has no chance of winning, has no way of telling. See, this is the best scam there is, right? You must lose, and you can never find out why. So, <laughs> you, well, how many years have you spent with me, dear daughter? Right, okay. So there's all that all the years I was a semi-professional poker player, so... I appreciate things like, oh, I can cheat you and you'll never find out. Oh, yeah, sign me up. All right. So, but to really appreciate how beautiful of a scam this is, we have to understand a little bit about quantum mechanics, okay, or at least quantum systems, uh, hence the postcard from Mars. Now, I'm a mathematician. I hate to say this to in public because we make our living being considered scientists. But, you know, we never use the scientific method in mathematics. Do I sample right triangles to decide if the sum of the squares of two sides or the sum of the square of the other side, and then make a case that I believe 13 times out of 20? No. Well, you see, if I'm a physicist and I can reproduce something 13 times out of 20, I'm a god. I get the Nobel Prize. You know, if I'm a chemist, 16 out of 20. If I'm an economist, 19 times out of 20 or a statistician. As a mathematician, it's all junk. I get no credit at all, because in mathematics, it's either a bright, shining truth, or it's a foul, disgusting lie, right? Goodell says there are a few statements that are can't tell, but those just we regard as irritating, okay? So there's none of the shares of gray. There's none of this preponderance of evidence stuff. It's either approved, you know, or it's disproved. We say one drop of sewage in a bottle of fine wine produces a bottle of sewage, okay? That's, uh, that's kind of how mathematics works. You know, I mean, if you're gonna show this dog, you have to comb all the fleas out of the fur. So, okay. So the way that we are sure that we know what we, and we believe in what's called the axiomatic method. That means axioms are things we just believe are true, okay? They're just true because we believe them. Uh, two points determine a line. Happy, happy? Most of you believe that, yes? until I stick you on the face of the earth and put the po one point the North Pole, the other point the South Pole, and you realize a straight line on the earth is a great circle. How many straight lines are there joining the North Pole and the South Pole? Zillions of them, every circle of longitude, right? So those two points don't determine a line. Oops. So you see an axiom either is true in the model you've got or it's not. Right? If it's true in the model you've got, you have to believe everything we deduce from the axioms about that model. 
But if the axiom isn't true, well, nothing, you know, nothing could be true. You probably believe, if you're an artist especially, and working on a flat Euclidean canvas, that if you have a line and a point off of it, there's one and only one line through the point parallel to the given line. Well, on the surface of the earth, there are no parallels, right? Any two great circles intersect. So that can't be true. See? So it depends on what you have. If the axioms are true, you have to believe the theorems. If the axioms aren't true, well, throw the theorems away too. They all go in the, in the trash together. So I want you to approach quantum mechanics the same way today. I'm going to ask you to believe things that to you are going to appear very counterintuitional. That can't possibly be right. Well, sadly, when you do enough physical experiments, they're right. Okay. So this is the way we're going to approach it. Okay. So I, the advantage of that is, is that I don't have to go as serious as, say, a working physicist. So since we're going to be looking at quantum technology, I'm not going to worry about how we're going to implement it. Is this uh, an electron film? Is this an ion trap? Is this um, a little QMAC with its bottle of liquid helium next to it? I mean, you know, I don't care about that. That's physics. That requires big infinite dimensional calculations. There are infinite number of locations, for example things like that. I don't want to bother with that. I want to get rid of as much of that as possible. And in quantum computation, we simplify things to the point where we can express everything in an elementary manner. And so that's what I'm going to teach you today. So if you're here thinking that when you leave here, you can go up to Battelle and get a job in their lab, sorry. Okay. But you might be able to go to Microsoft or uh, IBM, you get a job as a quantum computer programmer. That you would be able to do, okay? They actually build a quantum bit in your garage? No, okay? All right, so let's try that. So we're going to talk about the axioms of elementary quantum systems, okay? These are the kind that we use in quantum computation and quantum information. Uh, and I'm going to talk about ways how we keep track of everything. So there's going to be a lot of balls in this pattern that I'm going to hopefully you can all juggle and keep in the air, okay? So there are going to be a lot of balls. They're all going to be moving. And we're going to try to see if we can't get the pattern up and keep it up long enough for you to say, I juggled them, okay? And hopefully we'll do this over the bed so that when we drop a ball, we don't have to bend all the way down to the floor to pick it up. So, okay. Uh, let's see, number one. Coordinization axioms. Mathematicians love numbers. Yes. In fact, this is this is the thing that I always get is the worst thing about mathematics is that it's numbers, 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 and then it's letters. Okay. And that's what everybody hates about it. Okay. But we'll try to keep it numbers as much as we can. So we're going to talk about these axioms first. So the first one, and so now this is just a belief now. Okay. There's no way I can prove this. I'm going to read it in a minute. There's no way I can say this is definitely true. You know, a little angel came down on my, or a little devil came down on my shoulder and whispered it in my ear. But this is just something we believe. We believe that quantum existence is existing with something that we call states. Okay? There's a bunch of different ones. But at any instant, a quantum system is in one and only one state. Okay? Maybe that state is red. Maybe that state is tuned to an E. Who knows what that state is, but what, and whatever a state might be, quantum systems exist in them. Happy, happy? Okay, remember now we're keeping an open mind. Come on now, here we go. Uh, these states can be assigned numerical locations, what we like to call coordinates. You've probably graphed a function at some time in your life. Think back, some of you, I know it's a long way, right? But you know, you could graph things, remember coordinates? Go three units this way, four units up. Happy, happy, remember those? Yeah, coordinates, okay? And, uh, there, uh, and the coordinates come from what mathematicians call complex projective Hilbert spaces. And now, Steve, you lied to me and you're making me very, very angry. <laughs> you know, what is this postcard from Mars? 
Yeah, this postcard from Mars is uh, okay. Let me unwrap this last bit uh, in turn, and we'll work from the outside in. Okay, happy, happy, joy, joy. So, what is this strange object? Let's start with that word complex. That refers to the kind of numbers we're going to use. Okay, so complex numbers are well. They're obtained from the usual real numbers that you know and love and find on your ruler. Everybody, everybody in the room owns a ruler probably, right? Those are the real numbers that are on that ruler, okay? Uh, and it's called, the process is called Dixon doubling. So we induce an imaginary number. I always love this term, imaginary numbers. You know, can you imagine anything scarier than that? This is an imaginary number. What's it doing here, right? You know? Uh, that we'll call I for imaginary. Now, of course, the electrical engineers call it J for who knows what, but that's what they do. So if by mistake you pick up an electrical engineering book and see J, they really mean I. <laughs> I've never heard that this has bothered any engineer in the world. Anyway, but no matter for that. The important property about this imaginary number is that it is the square root of negative one. And you see, no real number will do that because when you square a number, it's always positive, right? A negative times a negative is a positive. A positive times a positive is a positive. So there are no square roots of negative numbers. This is why these numbers are called imaginary and why these other numbers are called real, as if a two ever came up and bit you in the ankle, right? You know, oh, look, a little cute little sex. How nice. Never. Okay. So this is a property no real number has. Okay. So it's important to have these. Then what do we do? Uh, we try to get the machine to work is what we do. Okay, oops, so we get two slides because I clicked it twice. We then consider all just, we just add them together formally. A is a real number. I take I, I multiply it times B, that's called scaling it, and I just add it together. How? I just do. <laughs> I just add them, right? And then addition multiplication, I perform as if they were polynomials. You've probably forgotten what those are. So geometrically, what you should think of a complex number as a planar number. This is a number in a plane. The A's are along the horizontal. The B's are along the vertical, all right? And then I can forget about the A's and B's and think of it rather as a distance from the center at an angle to the positive x-axis, okay? So it's a real length, R, and a real angle, theta. So our imaginary number i, then addition is lay heads to tails. So you just take the little arrows and lay them together. Put the tail of one on the head of the first. Happy, happy? That becomes addition. Multiplication is multiply the lengths and add the angles. Okay? This is just how it works. Okay? And so if you think about it in that way, uh, I can now tell you exactly where i is. I is the unit vector in the y direction. Why? Because the length is one, the angle is 90 degrees. If I multiply it times itself, one times one is, let's not always see the same hands. Okay. All right. So the length is one, and what's 90 plus 90? 180, that's the negative direction. So you see how I squared is negative one? See? No. Yeah, okay. Happy, happy, joy, joy, okay? So the, the I is an example of a special complex number. Those are the ones that have length one, because if I multiply any two of those together, I get a, another one just by adding the angles together. One times one is one. And if I multiply any other complex number by one of those, the length stays the same. R times one is R. And the angles just add. So I just added the angle of the unit one. Happy, happy? Joy, joy. See, now you see, we, we made progress already. See? see? So the next time you find yourself in one of Portland's social establishments and you want to strike up a conversation with that comely person next to you, uh, maybe you talk to them about, hey, do you know about imaginary numbers? <laughs> Works for me every time, I'll tell you. All right. So that was the complex part. <laughs> Deep cleansing breath. Now let's go to the other end of the sentence and let's just talk about a Hilbert space. Well, Hilbert was a famous mathematician who practiced uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So we named these spaces after him. And uh, what are they? 
These are nothing more than collections of spots, they're locations. Think of this as a, you know, they're just a, a chunk of, it's like the state of Oregon. There's a bunch of locations in Oregon. Here we are in Portland. Somebody else might be in the Dalles or somebody else might be in Harlan County. They're just locations. They have the property that I know how to scale them. I know what it means to take five of them. There's five times that location or negative six times that location or one half times that location. I can scale them and I can add them together. Okay. The numbers involved could be real or complex in Hilbert space, doesn't matter. Uh, there is a lot more structure than just addition and, and this scaling. Uh, I can measure lengths. I know how long one of these locations is. It's 15 miles between here and there, okay? And I can measure the angle between two such locations. Oh, they're 30 degrees apart, okay? Uh, I should say uh, it's all meant to agree with Euclidean geometry that we know and love, okay? And uh, when we're using complex numbers, let me just say that this requires care, okay? There's just a whole bunch of algebraic song and dance that you have to do, but it all works out. I have to say that were I a physicist and were we going to do implementation, there would be a whole horrible technical condition uh, because the spaces they have have on dimensions, more dimensions than we have numbers to count them. That's physicists. But that's not what we're going to do today. In the finite dimensional world of quantum computation, this condition is always satisfied. So we get to just ignore it. So please forget that I said anything and return to your happy life. Okay. Now the physicists are just like the French. And how are they just like the French? They have a different word for everything. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what it is. They have a different word for it. Okay. I would like to use the word linear combination by adding two scaled out things together. It's linear. That's the scaling combination. That's the adding. Okay. But they don't like that. See, because that means, you know, the riffraff can come and, you know, eavesdrop or something. And so they have their own word for it and they call it superposition, okay? So what does it mean to be a superposition? It means to be a combination of positions. So what does that mean? That means that there are very interesting conversations in quantum relationships. It says, what do you mean unfaithful? I've been here all the time. All the, I've been here at home all the time with you. Come on, Harvey, you know as well as I do that you can be in two places at once. <laughs> Okay, life on the quantum level. I mean, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit trickier, folks, than it is here. Now, I should also tell you that quantum objects have a very annoying property, and that is the annoying property is that they have a higher dimensional reality than the reality we experience, and so that means that they can take on completely different forms depending on how they intersect the three-dimensional reality that we live in. Now, let me drop the dimension by one. And I want you to think of the cone that your ice cream comes in. And I want you to think of it as being solid. And I want to think of you, instead of being a three-dimensional person, you live on a surface. And if that surface could come across that cone and geometrically in your existence, you would see this perfect circle. That's a very special geometric object, okay? Compared to the average blob that you just sort of get, okay? And on the other hand, if it flows through the plane of existence in another way, you don't see a perfect circle. You see a perfect triangle, okay? And you say to yourself, how can this, you know, how can this be the same thing? Well, the answer is, it is uh, the same thing. It's just that, your dimensionality isn't quite up to it. And what you're just seeing is a slice of it. Okay. This is why when they say, if you'd like to envision space time, you need an eye in your stomach looking out. <laughs> if that helps you at all, uh, God bless you. I would say in physics, the two forms that we talk about aren't circle and triangle, uh, but they are called the particle electrons and the wave, a light wave, okay? So we have particle forms and we have wave forms, okay? Now, wave forms are the trickier of the two. Here's a wave, 
drawn to you uh, by the program GeoGebra, which is uh, algebra for geometry. And uh, you'll see that it has three qualities, something called the amplitude, something called the frequency, and something called the phase. The amplitude is the volume. That's how high it gets, how big up and down. The bigger up and down, the louder it sounds to you. Okay. The frequency is the tone. If that was 440 cycles per second, you would tell me that, oh, that's the classical A. If it was 432 cycles per second, you would say, oh, that's the oboe A that the Nazi government uh, outlawed because the 440 A makes the music sound sharper and instills patriotism. So they outlawed instruments with the 432A in Nazi Germany. And if you had an oboe and it didn't play a 440A, off you went. So just people are crazy. You know, this is what they are. Anyway, so three things. Then now what is the phase? The phase is where it starts. If you take a look here, the phase here is zero. <coughs> it starts there at the origin, zero, zero, all the way over there on the left. Happy, happy? This is the, the standard waveform. If I want to make it louder, I increase the amplitude. If I want to change the tone, I increase the frequency or decrease the frequency. What happens, though, when I change the phase? That's a good question. Here are two waveforms that differ by a little phase, 0.72. Um, and you can see there where the middle of the red wave hits the x-axis just a little bit to the left of the one. That's the 0.72. That's where the wave starts going up and down. Okay. This is called a phase shift. And uh, as you all know from music, that if I have two waveforms and all they differ by is a phase and I play them for you separately, you can't tell them apart. If they have the same amplitude, they're just as loud. If they have the same frequency, they're the same tone. And our ears are not sharp enough to decide where did the tone start going up and down. So we don't hear phase at all. Okay. <laughs> so we call two waveforms like this phase equivalent because up to phase, they're the same. Okay. Happy, happy. And so the physicists, the physicists do the same thing with their waves. The physicists do the same thing with their waves. And, oh, I need to go back one. Sorry, I lost the point. Uh, go back one. Back to the bottom. How does phase equivalence manifest itself in algebra? Well, it's a change of angle. Yes? But we've just seen change in angle. That's multiplication by a unit complex number. Happy, happy? It's way down there at the bottom. Joy, joy, right? We complex numbers, right? We multiply it by a unit complex number that adds an angle in. Or if the angle was negative, it would subtract an angle out. Yes? This is exactly what phase is doing. It's adding in some angle to the starting point, or it's taking some angle away. Happy, happy now, maybe? See what I mean? We know what phase equivalence is what it looks for, like algebraically. So we have to accommodate this in our coordinate systems. Okay, we have to accommodate this notion of phase equivalence. Mathematicians have been doing that for close to 200 years in projective spaces. And it's exactly the definition is that we regard two coordinates are the same as if they differ by multiplication by a non-zero scalar. What we just talked about. Here's a phase that's shifting that coordinate V, well, it's not shifting it, it's phase equivalence. I regard those two things as the same thing. Why? Because when I observe them with my ears, they sound the same. Happy, happy? So this is the algebra. So the coordinates have to do this. Lambda is the phase, yes? Right, and we just steal the phrase phase equivalent from the musicians. All languages are good at this, right? Oh, that's a useful phrase, lay drugstore. Thing. This is a useful phrase. We'll just steal it, right? Okay, try again. 
Okay, now the coordination axiom of quantum mechanics say that each state of a quantum system is represented by a projective coordinate. Okay, so complex projective Hilbert space. We've got it all now, see? There are all the little pieces. We made it. For example, here's a little way that I could indicate the state heads. One head, zero tails. See that? One head, zero tails. Well, that would be the same as five heads and zero tails. The phase is five. I, our favorite imaginary number, heads and zero tails. Yes. Minus 37 I and zero tails. Right. And pi times I and zero tails. All of those four on the bottom are phase equivalent. So it's just a constant <laughs> multiplied times the original coordinate. Happy, happy? See what I mean? So yeah, so trust me, remember I said open, remember that open mind thing? Here we go, right? Is that any old time you want, you can bring a phase in. Any old time you want, you can pull a phase out and throw it away. See, this, this actually makes the arithmetic easier, right? Because there's this two that I really wish was gone. Well, you just throw it away. So you just factor it out, throw it away. It's phase. So we'll try some more here. Okay. CP1, what is that? Uh, complex projective one space. I, I couldn't fit up there in the corner. I could not fit a complex projective Hilbert space of one dimension. See that? That's a big long phrase, right? They only give me so much room on these slides. So complex projective one dimensional space, CP1. Okay. I could call that the complex projective line if I wanted to. Okay. So physical properties and bases. In other words, what are the things that, how can I get everything else out? Remember, everything is a combination of heads and tails here. Well, that makes that a, what's called a basis, and that's what we're talking about here. So let's see if I can do this quickly. The standard basis, you see, if I was going to say, what's the easiest possible basis? That's just this one. One head, zero tails, zero heads, one tail. I'm going to give them new names, uh, zero, that used to be heads and tails, that, that's now one, but I give them special brackets around them so that we know what we're talking about. Happy, happy? Just trying to make it simpler to write down because what happens is, is that things get so big they don't fit on the page, okay? So the two basis elements are zero and one. What does that mean? That means that any coordinate can be expressed as a superposition. Here it is, alpha, beta, A times one, zero, plus B times zero, one. Things work slot by slot. We add slot by slot. We multiply across all slots. Let's say alpha times zero plus beta times one. Happy, happy? Yeah, well, this is what we mean by a superposition. And this is just how we express it numerically. Just think of it this way. <coughs> This is just how we express it numerically because we want to do computation and calculation. Guess what we're gonna to have to use? Number, right? And I've already turned them into letters, so you're unhappy. Okay. okay. So Wigner's theorem of 1923 says that physical properties such as orientation, heads and tails, but maybe color, red and blue, you know, or maybe uh, charm, attractive and unattractive, or sheen, bright and dull, right? All of these could be physical attributes of my quantum system. And those physical attributes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with point pairs in my Hilbert space that are at right angles to each other, okay? So that there's no piece of the one in the other, and there's no piece of the other in the one. Happy, happy? Okay, that's, you know, this is, this is just the physicist proving things about, you know, quantum mechanics and things like that. And so now what have we got? We have states, yes. We have coordinates, so we have a numerical system to deal with them all. There are slaves now. We can run the coordinates, the system has to obey. All right, so what do I need to know about states? Well, I need to know how can states change? How can a quantum system change its state? Okay, it exists in states. 
one state at any instant. At some later instant, it might be in a different state. How could it get there? Okay. And again, these are just things that we're going to believe. Okay. Well, the first one is time evolution. It could just change over time. And there's a very famous physicist that came up with a very involved second order differential equation on how this works called Schrodinger's equation. You might have heard of Schrodinger's cat, which you can't tell if it's alive or dead, right? Because it's both and neither. Yes, you might have heard of Schrodinger, right? You know, this is his time evolution equation. But fortunately, in quantum computation, the time frames are so short, we can say this never happens. So in other words, we just throw it away. See that? This is how, this is how we make things simple. We just, this is annoying, say goodbye. Okay, so, all right, so no time evolution. Well, physics could happen, <laughs> yes. Right, physics could happen. I could add energy to the system. I could take energy out. Physics could happen. Yes, I could dip it in salt. I mean, who knows? I mean, physics happens. And what are these in coordinates? These are represented by operations that take a physical property to another physical property. Okay, so maybe it takes orientation to color or color to sheen. Okay, but it could take orientation to orientation. But the key thing about this not any old transformation will do. It has to be a transformation that does not destroy the notion of a physical property. If this started out as a physical property and I transform, it's still a physical property. Maybe a different one. Maybe I have to change my measuring device. But on the other hand, it's still a physical property. Okay, happy, happy. Again, we just believe this, right? Again, these are axioms. I can't prove them. You know, it's just... You know, we that scientific method you talked about earlier, we do the experiment enough times we believe that this is what we see. The last thing is the tricky bit, and this is called quantum measurement, because in the quantum world, what you see is what you get. In other words, if you have a quantum system and a physical property, that's that orthogonal basis, okay? Think orientation is our physical property, heads or tails, okay? When I look at that quantum system with my device that measures orientation, I see either heads or tails, okay? I am what's called projecting. You know, this states at an angle and it falls, it actually changes into heads or it changes into the state tails depending on what I see. Okay, and it does so in a particular way. It does so in a probabilistic way. In other words, given some property, orientation, I change the state I'm looking at, you know, which might have 27 components, right? Changes the state I'm looking at into one of these two basis states, one of these basis states, in this case, two, because it's a quantum bit, okay? It does so in a very specific way, and if my arrow would line up, it would actually advance. Come on, there it goes. So in other words, it's the square of the length of that state's coefficient to the square of the length of the superposition. So that's probably clearer if I give you the formulas. So here we have basis x, y, happy, happy. Maybe heads, tails, maybe blue, red, maybe, you know, shiny and dull, hot and cold. I mean, I don't know, whatever the physical property you're measuring. Right, And here's the superposition alpha, that's a complex number, it's a length and an angle, times x plus beta, that's a length and an angle, times y, that's my superposition, and I'm looking at it with respect to that basis x, y. So I'm going to either see x or I'm going to see y, I'm never going to see that combination. I'm going to see x or I'm going to see y. How often will I see x? I will see x that fraction of the time. Okay, the length of alpha over the square of the, that's the length of the superposition. That's a number between zero and one, that's a probability. And that is exactly how often I will see X and I will see Y with this probability. Notice these two add to one, yes? Notice they're positive 
non-negative, and they add to one. What you're looking at is a probability distribution, friends and neighbors. Okay, this is the probability I'll see X. Complementary probability is the probability with which I will see Y. What will I never see? Alpha X plus beta Y. I will never see that. Okay. Information theory actually has thought about this. Okay. Claude Shannon and the gang have long ago thought about this sort of thing. This is saying that only a probabilistic bit's worth of information can be extracted from a quantum bit. A probabilistic bit is in state heads with probability P, in state tails with probability 1 minus P. That's the amount of information you can extract out of a quantum bit in the state alpha, beta. Okay? Happy, happy? I know there's so many moving pieces. We'll get to a point. Real, let me, let's finish up Picard and Q, and then we can, because we're just about there. Okay, so this is this whole notion. I'll just speed through this. This is this notion that is called quantum stochastics. The idea of taking a quantum superposition and then measuring it. This is a way to randomize a couple of objects together, right? And you see it's a much deeper process than just assigning probabilities to the objects. Okay, so this is this notion of quantum stochastics as opposed to classical stochastics. Okay, so this is this new emerging thing. So I can zip through this. So let's see, let me burn through computing. Here's the way Turing wants you to think about computing. You take a bit, right? That bit is either a zero or a one. Happy, happy? You with me so far? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Alan. All right, a classical computation is performed when a register of bits evolves under the action of a Boolean transformation. Okay, so it has to follow the Boolean logic laws. Okay. This is called a logic gate. We organize this into a Boolean machine. And if I can approximate anything up, this is called a universal machine. A universal Boolean machine used to be called a Turing machine. Now we just call them computers and we carry them around in our pocket. Here's one. Okay, that's classical computation. In the late 1980s, the physicist uh, Richard Feynman uh, said, here's quantum computing. And it's basically the same. A quantum unit is a quantum dit. That's a devalued logic. So that's a vector in a complex projective, d minus one dimensional Hilbert space. If you wanted a quantum bit, d would be two, and we'd be talking about CP1, like we have been. Okay, a quantum computation is performed when a register of qubits evolves under the action of a unitary transformation. That's a matrix as a quantum logic gate. Quantum logic circuit, these are collected into quantum machines. You have a universal quantum machine, guess what that is? That's a quantum computer, see? Notice Mr. Feynman is just importing Turing's theory from the classical world into the quantum world. See that? This is why Mr. Feynman is a genius. In case you hadn't noticed, he was. I'll show you some sample gates, I'll just burn through these. Uh, the most important one is the Hadamard gate. This is this 90 degree rotation that takes the poles to the equators. Okay. Uh, in particular, there it is, H. And if I started off with the state zero and I ran it through H, what would come out would be uh, this state on the equator, which is zero plus one, which is the same as one half zero plus one half one which is the same as one over the square root of two, right? All of that, okay? That's the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate uh, takes the other basis element. Uh, I'll just click this a bunch of times and it'll just do it maybe. It takes it to its complement. Notice the difference between plus and minus. Those are antipodal on the equator, by the way, those two. But they're uniform in the fact that they measure the same way. Notice that whether I measure the one on the left or the one on the right, I see heads half the time, tails half the time. So here are two very different, even antipodal states that measure identically. See, this is this loss of information from a quantum bit to a probabilistic bit. Happy, happy? 
Okay, so let's see. What do I have other ones here? This is fundamental because these superpositions are uniform. They all have the same coefficient in front of them. Uh, this is a source of parallelism that simply is unavailable to classical computers. This is part of the speed up. So here's a couple more quantum knot that'll change it. Uh, I can control gates. In other words, they turn on if the control gate is a one and not, and I can do things like that to produce uh, entanglement. Uh, here it appears as the XOR operation. So let's, ex let's ex we can now do QSTAM. This is what I'm trying to get to. Believe it or not, through that long, torturous path through the woods, <laughs> right? And all of those walls that you're now holding perfectly in the pattern in the air, yes? All of that stuff you've got in your head, we can now appreciate the beauty of Q scan. All right, so let's go. So Q knows that this coin is in fact a quantum bit and can be in far more orientation states than just heads and tails. Number two, these states can look like this. Moreover, Picard can never see them. Yes, he either sees, uh, has your tails for that nice basis state, um, zero and one for the zero plus one basis state. Each of those probabilities is one half. Now, you know, the Hadamard operation does this. He also knows that if I apply Hadamard twice, it kills itself off. It's back to the beginning, up to phase. But we just throw those away. So we're back to the beginning. So, okay. <clears throat> Hadamard on his first move, Q places the coin into the state, heads plus tails. Okay, happy, happy? Well, notice now that Picard is toast. I'm just, right? Because what can Picard do? Picard only has two operations, leave it alone or turn it over. Well, if he leaves it alone, zero plus one stays zero plus one. If he flips them over, zero plus one produces one plus zero, which is zero plus one. So you'll notice no matter what Picard does, nothing happens. Isn't this lovely? I love it. This is lovely. And notice if right now Picard was looking, he couldn't tell. He'd see heads half the time, tails half the time. So Picard is being completely cheated and has no way of finding out. I love it. Why couldn't I have had this at the University of Poker on day three? Okay, so anyway, now he just applies Hadamard again, and now we're back to heads. And when I look at heads, what do I see? I see heads 100% of the time, which says Q wins every time, right? And so I'll just show you real quickly. Here's a quantum circuit, the single qubit. I hit Hadamard first, then that P is Picard's irrelevant move, right? And then Hadamard a second time, and then I measure it. That's the way it would appear as a one qubit quantum computer, this little game. That's the way it would appear. It's completely undetectable by Picard. And you see, this is a very good deal for Q. Okay, so maybe that's enough for one day. Okay, I have like a whole bunch of other slides that were what happens when both players have access to quantum technology. Here we have a classical player and a quantum player. The quantum player has what? The quantum player has an undetectable and irrevocable advantage over the classical player. This is called quantum supremacy. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. I'm sure there's gonna be some questions for those. We have a question from the audience here at Friendly House. Come on in, Dave. And now that I didn't understand 90% of it. I don't know a lot more. <laughs> um, okay, you said in the beginning that energy is in a continuous flow, which it's quantum. Or, and then yes. at the end, you started to use the term quantum, quantum bit. But I think yes. that a quantum is not a physical particle that doesn't have any mass, correct? And if that's correct, then how are quanta sensed? How are they measured? How do you really know if they're not physical particles with a mass? How do you know that they are actually there? Thank you. Oh, okay, so quanta is a generic term. 
uh, meaning discrete uh, chunks rather than continuous. A photon is a, it has a quanta of energy. It's massless. There's no mass in a photon. Uh, it has a certain amount of energy to it. Uh, they measure this uh, by taking a hydrogen atom and hitting its electron with a photon, and it jumps an energy level. It actually changes the little frequency that they see. So you remember spectro whatever, I can't pronounce the word, a spectrograph, right? You have little black bars where the energy is absorbed. And hydrogen has a particular pattern. And each energy state of the electron produces a different one of those little bars. That's how that spectra comes out. And so that's how they measure them. That's how they know that it's discrete. It was black body radiation that convinced them that energy did not come off uh, uniformly that it came off in quanta because uh, all the measurements told them that's exactly what happened. That's how it was discovered, if that's helpful. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> We've got a question from on the Zoom audience. Fail, fail humble, come on in. Yes, uh, I understand that uh, folks are building uh, quantum computers and folks have figured out uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, yes. You can get a free account from IBM right now. You could go online and they'd be happy to send you up an account for you to program in Qiskit and they would run your program overnight and give you the results in the morning. Uh, how are these algorithms implemented? Do you have to build a, a circuit that is all connected up uh, so that you don't pass the qubits through sequential gates, but rather everything's always connected all to, at, the, at the same time? You just load up the qubits at the beginning and at some point later measure an output qubit and it's probably the answer? Something like that. Um, basically, it's a giant machine depending on the type of technology. For example, what they call an ion trap uh, measures the spin of an electron in a particular atom, whether the spin is up or whether the spin is down. That's your logical qubit. Uh, that they use. The trick is being able to isolate and measure this single ion. And that's what all of the machinery uh, is. That's the way that uh, Intel is building their machine. Uh, different ones work on what's called photonic computers. They use photons as their bits. Other ones work on uh, heat signatures close to absolute zero. That's the way D-Wave does theirs. That's called adiabatic ones. Microsoft is working on something called topological quantum computation. It's a, they look at vortices in an electron film and they see how they pass around each other. The paths defining a braid, which define the quantum computation. The engineers are trying anything and everything because there's more money than God behind us. <laughs> because if you get if you get if you get a quantum computer working and IBM can IBM's computer, the eight qubit ones that they use, they can keep up for 500 nanoseconds at a pop, which is enough to run hundreds of quantum algorithms uh, in that 500 nanoseconds. Wow. And and then they just feed the output back to you. Wow. Uh, I just recommend you could just Google IBM quantum computer and you could be playing with it this evening. We've got several questions from the floor, so sure. please questioner number two. Uh, your talk was not on artificial intelligence. So first of all, I ask you and the moderators, can I ask a question uh, since you mentioned it? Go go right ahead. I'm, I'm happy to answer any question you'd like to ask me to the best so, of my so, ability. Um, 30 years ago, plus a few, as I began to formulate what I thought of this new topic, climate change. Um, and over the years since, as I've become more and more deeply and broadly informed on it, I still kept in mind, what is the consensus among those with real expertise? Because though broadly and deeply informed on it, I am not one of the experts. So I, I, in any field, took my hat to the experts. So my question for you on artificial intelligence is there are people with rich levels of expertise 
who are sort of telling us the opposite of what you said. You said that nah, no worries. And there are people out there actively saying, we better pay attention to this. It's something to be concerned about. I'm curious if you can put in a nutshell for us, how do you dismiss those concerns? Oh, I don't dismiss those concerns. I just don't agree with the extent of the danger. Because of you have to look at artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's trained on data developed by humans. And as you may know, it was just about everything humans do has flaws. Say that again? Everything humans do has flaws. And if I could train an artificial intelligence on perfect data, then I would be very worried about what it might do. But I have not seen an artificial intelligence that has been trained on perfect data, nor do I know a database that is perfect, that is not sort of sprinkled with uh, the effects of human frailty. So again, this is my opinion. I, I, I don't uh, say that this is the scientific consensus at all. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Steve. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Margaret. What can this computer, this quantum computer, be used for right now? What question could be answered? Does it really answer a question? Uh, yes. Um, right now, uh, the quantum algorithm for searching called Grover uh, gives you a quadratic, i.e. an X squared speed up in searching a database. So this isn't so much when your database has 4,000 entries in it, then instead of doing 200 searches in order to lay your hands on the answer, you only have to do 20. Uh, but on the other hand, if your database has 16 trillion elements in it, like say the number of cell falls called over a year, uh, and you wanna search for that one golden BB that you're looking for, Using Grover's algorithm, instead of having to do, um, what, what, are, what did I say, uh, 16 trillion? 16. So instead of doing 4 trillion searches halfway through the database, this is what you'd expect classically, you can get by in the square root of that, which is only 2 million, or no, 4 million searches. So if you compare, if you compare 8 trillion to 4 million, there's a really big improvement. Speed. <laughs> a really big speed up. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to talk about it, but uh, we were talking about quantum games here and quantum stochastics. And you might remember that uh, about a decade and a half ago, Wall Street had this bright idea of assembling stochastic combinations of securities. They're called derivatives. And you could invest money in these classically developed securities. And what happened? The whole system just collapsed, right? Well, friends and neighbors, what do you think is going to happen when these brokerage houses have QMAX on their desk with their bottles of liquid helium and can build quantum superpositions of securities? What do you think is going to happen then? See, I worry more about that than I worry about artificial intelligence. Thank you, Steve. Is that helpful? Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on in. <laughs> Um, when you were talking about uh, breaking down the kind of like X, Y, like alpha X plus beta Y and how you could kind of determine a like probability of X versus a probability of Y. My question on that was like, is that a formula that was derived through uh, like calculation or is that more something that like it is a relationship that has just been holding true as like research has been done and like we don't know why it's this way but this is just the relationship that we observe uh the latter okay that's why it's an axiom remember the way that i presented that was this is just what we believe okay i can't prove it you know it's just that the model accurately descri describes you know, when they form that family of entangled photons in Richland, Washington, and run the laser across the river to Umatilla, Washington, it describes accurately what they see in Umatilla. Cool. Perfect. So, Thanks. yeah, that's how physics works. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, I, I want to thank you for the uh, presentation. It was uh, really very good. Um, I live in space time, and um, uh, and the axioms that uh, determine my experience, my existence, don't seem to fit with the axioms that uh, uh, are at the basis of this uh, quantum computation. Um, what have you? What would you consider to be changes in axioms that would bring uh, my experience and this system more in uh, into uh, uh, agreement? Well, remember we threw out time, yeah, because the time frames are so short. If we want to have longer time frames in our experience and worry about space time, then we have to bring that one back in. And quantum mechanics uh, uh, accommodate space-time very well. It's just that the axiom system is much more complicated. And uh, we don't need those. Those parts are needed for the implementation, but they're not needed to understand the execution. And what I focused on today, because this is something you can convey to, to a non-expert, is how the execution of the computation works rather than the implementation. So yeah, the answer is a considerable number of changes would have to be made. Um, I'd have to force you to take a couple of terms of uh, graduate functional analysis just to be able to list them off, just so you'd understand what I was saying. Thank you. So they can be accommodated. It's just for understanding what a quantum computation is and what a quantum computation does, you don't need to understand how a quantum computation is implemented. How many of you could design the chip that runs your phone? You don't need to know that. You just need to know how to operate your phone. And I think that's my point. I'm talking about the operating bit. I've got two questions up, but they've got to be, so Jules, I'm going to make sure you're going to follow Al, but they both have got to be pretty quick questions. Okay. Okay, Steve, I'll, I'll give you, all right, Al. I'll give you two questions, whichever one you can answer the quick quickest. Uh, what happens when two quantum computers sit down to play Texas Hold'em? Or and what happens when a quantum computer tries to write a song? Okay. Uh, number two, noise. <laughs> so there's the quick one. Uh, the next slides that I brought were examining Texas Hold'em played over the quantum internet by people with access to quantum strategies. And the answer is you can do better in real life, that you do better playing over the quantum internet than you can in real life. Uh, you can find that on what's called the X archive, if you want the technical paper. Uh, it was written up for lay people in the New Scientist in 2009, uh, quantum poker, what happens when the chips are down or not. Uh, they wrote my little article up for a lay audience Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. I'm good at those, as you know. Uh, <laughs> that was either it's simultaneously a pun and not. Uh, anyway, uh, the answer is, is you can do, you will be able to do better playing poker over a quantum internet than you can do in real life. Okay. Simply because you'll have more strategies you can appeal to. Okay. And the game will turn inside out, but nice. that's a Instead of acting last to be better, you want to be setting the pace first, but that's a technical. Jules, you're going to close out our questions, but I'm asking you to just simply ask a question. Uh, it's very simple. Where does Brownian movement fit into the quantum world? How would you describe Brownian movement in quantum mechanics? Uh, it's way too big. Brownian motion is happens at a scale much larger than quantum mechanics and is really? governed by classical mechanics. The objects that Brownian move are sufficiently large that they're not governed, Brownian motion is not governed by quantum mechanics. It's governed by classical mechanics. You have to get a lot smaller. The, the Brownian particles are too big. You have to get real small. Real tiny. Real tiny before quantum mechanical effects take over. Steve, thank you. Thank it's, you. Thank you. Thank so you for much. having me. Yeah.
Yeah. Just the thought that there was a paper written in 2009 about poker, and this is so foreign to me, makes makes me really want to dig deeper, learn more, because it's it's out there. It's it's there, yeah. but seeing it or experiencing it is such a difficult, complicated thing for most people. Even as you said, Einstein said, "Oh, it's all you know, it's silly. It's not true." Well, yeah, Einstein never believed in right. spooky action at a distance. He right. he uh, went to great lengths to explain it other ways that turned out to be false. Yeah. So I mean, I mean yeah, it was his one great mistake. Yeah, but even a great mind like his couldn't couldn't let go, couldn't yeah. let go of that Newtonian. Yes. Conditioning that we get living at the large scale. Yeah. And that there's people that like you that understand this and just it's it makes sense. Thank well, you. Well, it's an advantage being a mathematician because I'm used to dealing with axiomatic systems. Yeah. You know, it's like you we start that we start our kids, or we used to start geometry with Euclid. Right. Two points to determine a line. Right. But now that but, but now that. we do it differently. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for having that me. Insight. I really appreciate thank you. the opportunity.